Yeah, thanks very much. It's been a, a really great visit. Uh, and uh, so today's talk is a little more, you know, the first two talks halfway between science and meta science. This one is really much more of a neuroscientific talk um, that's going to focus on kind of what we've learned from imaging about the dynamics of brain networks. So kind of the question of how we understand brains in terms of integration across the brain versus sort of segregation of functions in different regions is probably one of the oldest debates in neuroscience, right? So you had people like the you know, Gall and the phrenologists making claims about individual psychological faculties being localized to particular regions. And while they had the, the method of localization wrong, they actually, they, at least some people think that they kind of got it right in terms of thinking that, you know, individual brain areas perform different types of functions. Um, on the other hand, you have people like Lashley who claim, well, there is no relation of function. His experiment's wrong. In the correct places, he probably would have a function. So more recently, you know, in the last couple of decades, the methods of network science have sort of highlighted the fact that thinking about a, a system, a complex system, as either being integrated or being segregated is probably uh, sort of a red herring. That you know, si most complex systems, they brain networks or power grids, uh, whatever you look at, tend to have sort of some combination of both integration and segregation that we can understand using the tools that have been developed out of graph theory and network science. Uh, and certainly, you know, when the brains are certain created into what we call modules or works, things like the visual system, somatomotor system, or the default mode network. But those, those things also, uh, okay. So we can use these tools to understand this sort of, you know, combination of modular functional organization with sort of communication amongst the modules. And so what I'm going to on a lot today is, you know, how we understand these kind of questions using functional imaging. Now, in the last couple of decades, there's been a huge push towards using to try to understand brains, functional networks, right? Um, using this term functional connectivity, right, which really means correlation in activity across um, states uh, after right. But if not, you know, the idea is you just have someone scanner do nothing. People do when they're do, um, and then you activity correlates across different parts of the brain. If you put a speed in posterior cingulate, I that correlate with that in other parts of the cortex is what has come to be known as the default mode network by people. It took me a long time to come around to thinking that resting state fMRI was interesting. The paper that really got me to start thinking that was this one um, from Smith and colleagues where they basically did a, a technique called independent component analysis that pulls out sort of correlated parts of the data. Um, and they did it on rest state data, and then they did it on data from the brain map database, which is you know, a database of task, both PET and fMRI, and patterns, very different types of data. But it turns out when you apply the same technique to both of those, you actually get very similar networks, right? And so that suggests that whatever's coming out of the, whatever we're seeing in the correlated fluctuations in, at rest is actually really similar to what you see when you have people do task in terms of, you know, which networks are most strongly associated with, which regions are strongly associated with which others. Um, but there's a number of assumptions when, when I've, so that came out in 2009 and I've kind of started getting more interested. Um, but I, you know, at that point, everybody was kind of assuming that connectivity was stable over time, both, you know, over minutes and over, say, weeks and months, um, and that there was this kind of common structure shown by any individual. But the problem was that most of the studies hadn't really collected much data from each individual. They might collect 10, maybe 20 minutes from an individual. Um, so we put together a project um, called, we, we ended up calling the My Connectome Project, to basically try to test this out, right, by deeply sampling data from one individual that happened to be me. 
Um, so I, I'll show you what we did. This is Tim Lauman, who was at that point a grad student at uh, Washington University in Steve Peterson's lab. They heard about the, they weren't initially involved in the design of the study, but they heard about the study and um, were so intrigued by the data that we ended up collaborating. And Tim ended up doing a lot of the pre-processing work on the data using the tools that they have for resting state analysis. This is a, uh, a timeline. Every tick on, this, on each line is one measurement. Um, and this is over about a year and a half. So you can see that the measurements were pretty solid except for this few month break and then another kind of short break there in, in early 2014. Um, and so we basically collected a lot of data, data over the course of a year and a half. Um, ended up with 84 uh, resting state sessions each 10 minutes long. So we have 840 minutes of resting state um, over the course of that year and a half. And that's going to be the thing that, that I'm going to talk about today. So this is what the data acquisition schedule looked like for all of those weeks. Whenever, basically, whenever I could, whenever I was in town, um, I got in the scanner. Um, and sometimes I couldn't because of weather or because of travel. Um, but basically, the idea was at the same time, I would in the scanner and do a resting state scan and then either diffusion or task fMRI scan. Um, on Tuesdays, I would immediately then go and have my blood taken. And we did analyses that I'm not going to talk about looking at gene expression and blood. Um, then much about there's a, a ton, almost all the data except for my diary entries are available online either at myconnectome.org or some of them are through one of the the genetics data are available through one of the U.S. Uh, government websites. Um, just want to point out that you know this data has already been used in this is just a smattering I think there's well over 20 papers now that are either published or in preprint that have taken the data and done things everything from you know analyzing I plasma RNA control using it to look at Blaise de has been doing work looking at vascular effects on resting state. Lots of different stuff you can do with this really unique data set. And that's part of why we wanted to kind of make it all publicly available. So one of the questions we wanted to ask was basically how much data is enough? So, you know, we people have kind of assumed, well, I can collect 10 minutes of resting data and that is a good reflection of a person's kind of question is whether that's true or not. So what we did was we took my data and broke it into basically two, you know, two different parts and then said, what's the correlation if I say take, you know, five sessions here and five sessions here and compute a connectome off of each of those where the connectome is just the correlations in the signal between all the regions. And I'll tell you what the regions are later. Um, and then ask how correlated are those patterns? What's the reliability of the patterns that we estimate? And a good bit more than people had been previously collecting. So this was how the correlation between the two halves, which is sort of like the reliability, asymptotes as a function of the amount of scan time. And you see that it flattens out it correlation by about 30 minutes. And starts to flatten out around 100 minutes, right, which is substantially more data. And these are good data, right? I didn't move very much. It's a pretty fast, you know, um, fast TR, 1.2 seconds, fairly high resolution. They're probably about as good as resting data get. And um, nonetheless, you need a lot more data than most people have collected in the past in order to get a good estimate of the connector. So the next thing we wanted to do was basically figure out, you know, what's the regional structure in the brain and how does it relate to what had been seen before. And so Steve Peterson's group had developed this set of tools for basically parcelating the cortex. I'm not going to go into detail about this, but the idea is you basically look at where the patterns of correlation break down along the surface of the cortex and you break up the cortex into small regions that have very homogeneous correlation patterns amongst the, the voxels within them. You end up getting this map of all these different regions. And this is uh, the yellow lines here are meant to show you that these parcellations are highly consistent. This is the reason that Steve's group first got involved in this is because they, they wanted to be able to test whether their parcellation techniques actually give you something consistent. So this is taking two sets of 42 sessions, so 420 minutes, doing the parcellation on it, and then asking how consistent are those parcellations across those two subsets. The yellow lines are the places where 
both subsets give you the same answer. And what you see is that other than little sort of bits around the edge, it's pretty much consistent. Right? So this is telling you that there's this, there's this consistent structure along the cortex such that you get regions that are sort of interestingly blob-sized um, that seem to be sort of at least connect, connectionally coherent. Now one question is whether they're functionally coherent. Um, the early work that we did, this has been followed up by a bunch of work from, uh, from the Dosenbox group that's basically shown that these resting state parcellations really do pick out functionally coherent areas. This, um, with Alex Huck's group, we did retinotopic mapping on my visual cortex, just using the standard kind of rotating wedges and, and rings. Um, and the gray lines here are the, um, the resting state parcellation uh, breaks, right? So it's basically where the resting state data is telling us that there's a, a change in connectivity. And then the, from the colors, you can see basically the retinotopic mapping. And what you see is that the boundaries, say, between V1 and V2 map very closely to boundaries that are found in the resting state data, suggesting that it really is mapping out functionally coherent regions, even though it's just me sitting there. And I should note, all this was done with my eyes closed. I, can't, I couldn't stand to sit on a scanner with my eyes open for 10 minutes because I start hallucinating. Um, so I did it all with my eyes closed. I don't think I fell asleep for real at all, but I know I was kind of verging on sleep at some points probably. Um, so that, and that's an issue that we talk about in the paper. Um, so we have data from all these. We're going to work now in this, this parcel, what we call parcel space. So we found, I think, 616 cortical parcels across my brain. Um, and um, and then we also have some subcortical regions we look at. So then what we do is we basically look at what the structure is across those. So you can take those and Steve use some kind of clustering. Steve's group usually uses the InfoMap algorithm. Um, and basically when you do that and then you reorder things according to the clusters, you see that there's reasonable structure such that there are areas that, there are sets of areas that correlate highly with one another and then also kind of negatively correlate with other sets of areas. This is kind of a standard um, kind of pattern that you see when you look at rest state data. Um, so we're, we think of this, you know, what people generally do then is go in and put names on these um, networks, right, which are usually based on kind of the areas that pop out. And so this is the different groups have different naming schemes. This is the naming scheme from, from C. Peterson's group. Um, so this is showing that my brain has all the usual resting state networks. Some of them are a little weird in ways that I'm going to come back and talk about, but they're all there. Right? I have a default mode network, I have a visual network, I have a somatomotor network, and so on. Um, so the question then is how does that relate to, um, to what you see in group data? So at the top are, is a, a, basically the same method applied to a bunch of people, um, I think 120 people that had been collected. Um, and roughly things are kind of laid out the same. You know, we, I have a default mode network that's in the middle just like everybody else does. I have a frontal parietal network. But there's some weird things too, right? So for example, I have this little spot of, um, I think that one is a frontal parietal spot. Um, and then I also have a salience network spot down in the um, kind of the, the medial channel, right in the middle of the default mode, right? That's all supposed to be default mode according to everything that we knew from the group studies. But it turns out that I have a weird little spot there. Um, I also have my visual cortex breaks out into two parts, kind of a medial and a kind of early visual, a later visual cortex, whereas you don't see that in the, uh, the group data. That may well have to do with the fact that I was uh, imaged with my eyes closed and those data were collected with eyes open. Um, and then also, sort of, you know, um, in the group data, you see that there's the somatomotor network breaks out into the might actually sort of sits there as one. Um, and so there's, there's interesting, even though the, the global pattern is similar, there's, you know, interesting differences. Um, so you might ask just, you know, is Russ Poldrack a weirdo? And that may well be true, but, um, but these, it seems like most people actually show similar, when you collect enough data, you can see that most people show similar kind of intrusions where something that should be based on the group data, one network has region part of other networks. So this is from the Midnight Scan Club data set from Dozenbach and colleagues, um, where they scanned 10 people for some number of hours, you know, late at night, hence the name Midnight Scan Club. And they found 
you know, for example, seven subjects had a salience feature down in that area in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex that should be in default mode. Um, so, it, 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 so it's not just me, right? If you look hard enough, if you get enough data from people, you find that there's actually sort of detailed features there. So another thing you see is that um, nearby regions show really distinct, can show really distinct connectivity patterns. So this is group data. And you take these two spots from the lateral prefrontal cortex and you ask basically, so those two spots one and two, and you look at their connectivity patterns and then look at the difference, you basically see no difference in their connectivity patterns. Same thing with me, right? Same two cortical, or, uh, cortical surface, look at their correlation with the rest of the brain. You see huge differences in how those two very, very nearby regions are correlated with the rest of the brain. Suggesting again that if you look hard enough, you have enough data, you can find these very distinct connectivity patterns. Now, a bunch of work, there's interesting recent work from Randy Buckner's group and Rod Braga showing that in a number of the resting state networks, you actually get these interdigitated um, sub-networks that kind of sit next to one another, uh, kind of similar to this. Okay, so how stable are these signals over time? This is one of the things that we set out. We really want to understand this. So one of the things we can do is compute the variability across sessions. So we take, this is the, for each, each kind of, you know, point in this map is, in this uh, matrix, is one connection between two regions. So the rows and columns are the regions, the parcels. And we're basically saying the color map is how variable is connectivity in each of those, between each of those parcels over time. Um, and below, right? And so there's not very much variability, well, at least if I show you in comparison to the across subjects, you can see that in general, a person's variability is more than variability across subjects. Um, probably more importantly, the regions that show high variability are very different within a person as opposed to between people. If they were the same, then you'd say, well, we don't need to study individuals. We just study a bunch of people because it's the same thing. So for me, the, the regions that had the highest variability were in the visual cortex and the somatomotor cortex, whereas across subjects, you see a bunch of regions showing variability that, that don't really overlap with the ones that show variability over time in me. Um, so that says that we really need to dig in more deeply on individuals because the things that we want to learn, particularly if you're interested, for example, in understanding pathology, right? Do you want to understand schizophrenia? We know that people with schizophrenia variability of time in their function. Before we can understand that, we really need to understand what's going on within healthy people. Over time. So what about changes over time? So remember I mentioned on Tuesdays I had to have a blood draw, Thursdays I didn't. Um, that meant I needed to be fasted and uncaffeinated because that would affect the blood draw. On Tuesdays I had, had breakfast and coffee. So we had a natural experiment there. We, we can't pull apart food and coffee because I basically did both each time. Um, these show the, the map, connectivity maps and the difference um, over time. And the, the really interesting thing that comes out of this is that there was actually greater connectivity in certain networks in where I was unaffected and fast. And that may well be because I was more tired on those days. Um, we'll come back and talk more about that later. What's well, interesting is that connectivity changed overall. It changed in a very specific way, right? So um, a standard kind of you know, like representation of connectivity, which is threshold connectivity at, I think, 1% highest connections, and then use a spring embedded map to show you the network. And you can see that the relationship between like default network, front of are basically in the same place. It might be a bit more integrated when I'm fed and caffeinated, but they're a bit more spread out here. But at least they're kind of like looking pretty much the same. So, with the visual and somatomotor networks, right? They go from basically dead and caffeinated, they're basically disconnected from one another. They have no direct connections. Whereas on the days when I'm fasted and uncaffeinated, those sets of networks become much more strongly integrated, right? Suggesting that, you know, it's not just that we've kind of turned everything up or down, but we've really changed the mode of operation of the brain uh, through that relatively simple intervention. Questions so far? Correct. Okay. Would you interpret this or could you interpret this also as a condition where anyone needs to be more uh, receptive to the environment, uh, to search of food, for example, or for resources, or uh, 
speediness at the same time that you have a uh, not optimal physical condition to avoid the environment. That's yeah. That's kind of the story that that I would tell. I mean, it's hard to know, right? But um, yeah, I think the idea is that you're because of, yeah that you're you know, either because of drowsiness or simply because of being hungry, you're in a more basic state, so you're more receptive to info. But it's hard to pull it apart from whether it might have to do with like you know kind of falling asleep or something like that. We don't really know because you could imagine that you get like greater correlation in those regions if you start falling asleep. Um, even though, like I said, I don't think I fall, I don't think I fully fell asleep. I'm pretty sure I didn't, but um, we don't have EEG, so I don't know. But yeah, it's an interesting question. And how do you expect that this to be if you were sleep the drive? Yeah. Uh, if you were to leave the drive for a long time, let's right. say for 24 hours, how would you sleep? That's a good question. I don't actually, I don't know the literature on sleep deprivation in resting state, so I don't actually know what I would expect. Yeah, I should look at that. So it may well be that this is not about falling asleep, but about trying to stay awake. Right. Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah, no, you're right, exactly right. This could be, it could be neural or it could simply be vascular. Yeah, and we don't, or interaction, and we can't pull that apart here. I think that's exactly right, yeah. That's why we, we try not to make any too strong claims about the effects of food and caffeine. One, because we can't pull apart food and caffeine, and two, because, yeah, we don't know whether it's vascular or neuronal or both. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm not getting in the scanner anymore, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's there, there's there's a lot of interesting stuff that could be done here. Yeah. Okay, so let's now ask, you know, we've looked at kind of things changing over, you know, the kind of variability of our sessions. One question is are there any interesting dynamics over the longer period? So um, Max Schein, who you'll hear more about later, is a postdoc. I was really interested in, kind of got me interested in dynamics. I started looking at this by basically just taking all of the sessions, taking the connectivity matrix, kind of the static connectivity matrix from each session, and just clustering them over time. And basically what you see is that two clusters come out. Um, and, you know, obviously if you tell it to find two, it will find two. Two seems to be a pretty stable solution here. Um, and this is the timeline where the, the red ticks are the first, uh, the presence of the first, uh, what we call meta state. The blue ticks are the presence of the second meta state. And um, if we ask how do these meta states differ, um, 
the one thing he did was to take, so every day, right after I got out of the scanner, I did a version of the positive and negative affect scale, which asks you a bunch of questions about how you're feeling right now, or how, I, for me, I answered, like, how was I feeling while I was in the scanner? And what he found was that on days when I was in that meta state one, I was more likely to say yes to items like drowsy, sleepy, sluggish, tired, whereas when I was in meta state two, I was more likely to say yes to attentive, concentrating, and lively. Um, and if we look at the, the maps on top are basically the, the um, you know, similar maps to what I showed you before, but now comparing days when I'm in Metastate 1 versus days when I'm in Metastate 2. And even though the Metastates weren't significantly correlated with food versus, uh, um, food and caffeine versus not, um, they show a very similar pattern, right, in that on the top, when I'm in the sluggish state, you get the visual and auditory networks you know, kind of integrating here when I'm in the other state, they kind of break apart a little bit. And I think what might have been going on is you see that the, 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 the sleepy meta state is particularly present uh, kind of early in the, um, in the course of the study. And kind of, gra I think I gradually just got more comfortable being in the scanner. Um, so that tells us that, you know, there are things changing over longer periods. Um, and there, I think there's still, there's still a lot more work to be done. There's only so much one data set, right? So, um, so, so we know resting state networks clearly are functionally relevant, um, but we probably need more data than people have usually been collecting. They're largely stable over time, but they do show systematic sources of variability that, that don't look like between subject variability. And there's also idiosyncratic differences between people. And we're just starting to learn more about that. So I just want to highlight the fact that you know, within other areas, like in, for example, in the aging literature, people have been thinking a lot about how do you understand variability at multiple time scales at once. So this is, for example, work by Nilam Ram and colleagues, which has looked at how do you model kind of things changing at, at a very quick scale at the same time as things changing at a big scale. We don't have enough data to do this yet. This is where we is being able to ask at the same time in a robust way how, you know, how are kind of fast dynamics overlaid on slow dynamics. Um, and so we just we basically need a lot more work looking at densely scanned individuals. Because right now, the number of data sets available is less than 20. So now I want to turn to what we've learned about short range dynamics of functional connectivity. Um, and there's if you've if you've gone to the human brain mapping meeting in the last few years, you know that there's been a ton of interest in what's called dynamic functional connectivity. Right? How does connectivity change? How does Correlations between regions change over the course of seconds and minutes uh, during functional scanning. And you know, various people have had stories about how this works. This is work from Vince Calhoun's group. Um, and so you know, one thing that people often do is what they call a sliding window approach, where you take a window, compute the correlation within that window, and kind of move that over time. There are issues with that way of doing it. Um, and so we've, we use a slightly different approach for the work that I'm going to show you. I want to say a bit about, um, so the, the focus that we're going to have here is not some on kind of you know, specific pattern of connectivity change, but really how does the degree of integration or segregation change? So I mentioned in the beginning that that's like, you know, one of the really important questions that we wanted to ask for a long time, brain function. So I'm going to show you now how it is that we characterize that. And this, so this is a set of ideas that come from the, the literature, kind of the more global network science literature. Um, we can, basically what we do is we break the brain into a set of modules, and I already showed you how we could do that into our kind of sub-networks, like the visual network and default network and so on. Then we can ask two questions. One is, within each network, how strongly are the members of that network connected to one another? Um, and we compute that uh, by, with something called a module degree z-score. It's basically for each region, how strongly is it connected, what's its degree with other uh, regions in the network? Um, and if that's really high, right, then that is going to, if you, you see that, you know, that you get a lot of connection within each module, that tells you something about kind of the, the degree to which function is segregated across the brain. So you might have two networks here, right, and, um, you know, this one has a high module degree because it's connected to several other regions within its module. This one has a low module degree because it's only connected with one within its module. So we can start to characterize 
across regions, across you know, regions within a module, how strongly are they connected to other parts of that, uh, that network, that subnetwork? Um, on the flip side, we can also ask how do individual regions communicate or correlate with regions outside of their individual module? And we do that using this thing called a co uh, participation coefficient. So for example, this one would have high participation because you know, it's a member of the purple, I'm colorblind, I think that's purple, right? The purple uh, module, but it also talks to some of the, the, um, the regions in the, the other module as well. Whereas something with low participation, sorry, uh, basically would only be talking to regions, other regions within its same module. So it's basically asking, how much communication is there between the module, the, the different modules in the, the system? Now the way that this is often laid out in network science is, is what's called cartographic analysis. It comes from this work by Guimera and Nunez Amaral, where they basically laid out a, a graph of, um, on the one axis you have uh, the module degree z-score, on the other axis you have participation. And the idea is that if your module degree z-score is high, right, if you're highly connected um, within your module, then you're, we're going to call you a hub, right? It just basically means you're carrying a lot of information. Um, sometimes, you know, the hubs might just be talking to their own module. Um, so those are called, uh, they call them here peripheral hubs. People often call them provincial hubs. Um, but sometimes a hub could also be talking to a lot of other things. It has a higher participation, so it's more connected with other modules as well. Those are called connector hubs. Um, so what we generally do is instead of kind of, we're not, we don't care so much about calling something a hub or not. We want to understand the distribution of connectivity across the whole, the entire network. So what we will usually do is something we call a cartographic profile, where we basically just do a joint histogram across all of the, all of the, the region, a joint histogram of their module degree z-score and their participation coefficient. That shows us something about the state of the network at any particular point in time. Um, so and generally it would be some cloud where basically the, the color in the cloud is like the density of that particular va combination of values of module degree z-score and participation coefficient over time. Um, and so if you do this dynamically, right, if you look at, this is showing basically how this thing changes over time, what you see is that usually the brain sits in this kind of fairly integrated state where between, you know, the, between module z-score, uh, sorry, the participation coefficient is pretty high, but then it sort of, probably saw it kind of pop back there, right? Occasionally it kind of pops back into a much more segregated state. Um, and so this Mac wrote a paper back in 2016 where we sort of did some initial analyses of this with the Human Connectome Project data. Um, Mac is somebody who did a postdoc with me and ended up getting something like five or six papers without collecting any of his own data. Everything he did was on data that was shared by other people. Um, so if you, if you take these um, topographic, these uh, cartographic profiles and you cluster them over time, you basically can see that, you know, most of the time the brain is in a relatively integrated state. It looks sort of like this, but occasionally it pops back into a much more segregated state. Um, and you, this is just showing it for one subject over time. And you can see it almost, it's almost like it pops up and then it kind of goes back down this, if you look at the participation. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of debate about what this means, right? It may well have some, in fact, we think it does have something to do with arousal, as I'll show you. Um, but nonetheless, it shows us that there seems to be some, uh, some interesting dynamics. Now, for me, if I see something in resting state data, I don't really know what to make of it generally until I can see that it's relevant to some kind of behavior or cognitive function. So the next thing we did here was to ask how do those fluctuations relate to ongoing cognition? Um, now, earlier work, so Jess Cohen, a faculty member at, um, at uh, North Carolina, had done some work uh, in her postdoc looking at different tasks and how they change in, their, um, in the, the graph structure. And she saw, for example, when you do a difficult task, modularity is basically going to make them talk more to each other, um, suggesting the brain might become more integrated when you do a difficult task. So we looked at this across different tasks in the um, Human Project data. And so this is, for example, showing you, that we, if you just take that cartographic profile, you can now do a statistical comparison to say basically what parts of the profile are more present or higher in density 
for one task versus another are lower. So the red parts here are higher. This is basically one way to think about this is when you go from doing the in-back task, from, do, from resting to doing the in-back task, the whole cartographic profile just shifts to the right. And in fact, what you see on the right here is a quantification of that shift. We basically quantify how far do you have to move the cloud from rest to each of these different tasks in order to get it to best match. So like an image alignment uh, problem with one transformation along one axis. And you can see basically as the task gets harder, especially for the in-back task, basically that cloud moves to the right. So it's basically saying that harder tasks, it's not probably not just harder, but more complex tasks seem to drive the network towards more integration. Now, there's still questions about what are, we think there's probably specific features of the tasks that are going to be more or less likely to drive integration. And that's something that we're working on now, but we don't quite understand yet what, what exactly the task factors are. Clearly, something like working memory load seems to be one of them. Um, we also wanted to look at individual differences across people. And so um, if you were at my talk the other day, I talked about drift diffusion models. This is a, <coughs> a model that we apply to data when we have reaction time and accuracy data on a task, and we want to sort of address the fact that people can exhibit speed accuracy trade-offs, right? They can be fast and highly a and sort of have bad accuracy. They can be slow and have good accuracy. They have kind of the same underlying ability. It's just they have a different trade-off between speed and accuracy. The drift diffusion model basically takes the data, takes the reaction time data and, and accuracy data, and turns them into a set of latent variables that are more reflective of cognitive functions. One we call drift rate, which is really how fast do you process, how quickly do you process information. One is what we call boundary separation or caution, which is basically how cautious are you being in the task. And the other is what we call non-decision time, which is how much time do you need to do all the stuff that isn't involved in making a decision. So when we do this for each person, and we ask now across people, how does the nature of integration or segregation relate to cognitive function across, um, this is on the NBAC task, I believe you basically see that there's no relationship to caution, right? But there is a relationship to drift rate such that people who process information faster on these tasks have higher integration. There's also a negative relationship with non-decision time. So basically people who do the, all the non-decision stuff faster also have higher integration. Um, so this shows us that there's some relevance to of this stuff to ongoing cognition. We also have some sort of preliminary results that show that um, Basically, if you look at the time right before the trial, people are more likely to make an error the, the less integrated they are. Right? So this basically shows that correct trials are more likely when you're in a more integrated state. Um, again, showing that this stuff isn't just, um, you know, it's not just something that's there in the resting data, but it really is relevant to how people perform tasks. Um, and we're, Patrick Bassett in my lab is now doing a bunch more work along these lines. So what might be driving this? Well, one idea that Mac came up with early on was that it may be due to the effect of neuromodulatory systems, right, or also systems like the, I mean, our, the neuroadrenergic system was our kind of primary target, but it's hard to pull these systems apart, right? We know, for example, from this, you know, work by Reimer and colleagues that, you know, you get, you know, we know that ultimately when the neuroadrenergic system turns on, you get pupil dilation, but the cholinergic system is also kind of sitting there in between. Um, and we also know that from you know, a lot of work from David McCormick's group that this stuff is related to not just pupil diameter, but to changes in you know, cortic, states of cortical uh, information processing. So um, we were able to obtain a smallish uh, data set uh, that did simultaneous resting state and pupillometry. Um, and we basically asked, looked at the correlation between pupil diameter and uh, you know, at a particular point in time, and uh, network segregation integration. And we see, similar to what we've seen with tasks, that basically um, there's higher network integration in general when the pupils are more dilated. Suggesting at least consistent with the idea that, um, you know, that there may be some relationship to, um, to arousal, also helping us sort of um, squash the idea that it might just be people falling asleep, right? Because here, you know, if you're getting good pupil data, presumably the people are not asleep, right? So it probably is an arousal effect, but it's not, a, it's not a person falling asleep. So what might be going on here? Well, one, one idea that has been, you know, floated for a while around the, particularly the neuroadrenergic system, is this idea that it may sort of modulate the gain of neural function. It's not that it causes neurons to fire 
sort of more, it causes them to fire sort of more selectively, right? So the idea is that you turn up at least to a degree, it's, it's generally one of these inverted U functions, but right? you turn up neuroenergic function and you get uh, higher responses to the, the target stimulus and lower response in the background. And um, John Cohen, Aaron Eldar, and Yal Niv have laid this out in terms of the idea of neural gain, right? The idea is that you're basically, for any particular input, you're turning up the sharpness of the output of the response to the neuron to that input, such that it's more likely to respond to high inputs and less likely to respond to low inputs. So you're sharpening its response. Now, I, I think that's a cool idea, but I need some way to get an intuition about, you know, we're looking at these very high-level network descriptors like participation coefficient, stuff like this, right? I don't, I don't have a good way to get an intuition about how I would expect like turning up neural gain to affect very high level features of a network like that. And so uh, what we did was we moved to try to use neuronal modeling to, um, to try to understand this. So we, we worked with um, this toolbox called the Virtual Brain from Randy McIntosh and Victor Yersa and colleagues. Um, which allows one to build um, you know, simulations, dynamic simulations of brain networks. So the idea is you take a known connectivity matrix. In this case, we used a macaque monkey connectivity matrix with, I think, 60-something regions, 70 regions. Um, so you take those regions, you wire them together based on the known connectivity of the macaque brain. Um, and then each of the regions you just treat as a very simple oscillator. It's like a, you know, a very simple model of a population of neurons that gets input runs it through some kind of you know, input function that's usually some kind of sigmoid, and we're going to vary, we're going to vary two things. We're going to vary um, kind of how steep that is and also just how, how tall it is. That gives you an estimated neural time series, right? Once you just kind of turn these things on, let them run, they, you know, every one of them has some noise, so it's going to basically just create these noisy neural time series. Then you run those through a balloon model to get estimated fMRI time series. And then we can do all of our same analyses on those kind of estimated fMRI time series to ask, now, what happens when you, um, you, know, when you turn up neural gain? So this is what turning up neural gain looks like. If we, you look at the function that relates to the input to the activation or the output, um, neural gain is basically the steepness of that function. And then excitability is basically just how tall it is, like how much bang do you get on the output for some level of input at sort of at its maximum input. Everybody clear on that? Questions? Okay. Um, so the, the, there's an interesting thing that happens here. So you may know that there's been a lot of interest in criticality in the, the neuroscience world you know, recently. Um, and with arguments being made that you know, brains and many other complex systems operate at this kind of like near critical border where critical means basically you know, you're moving from a relatively uh, kind of disordered system to a very highly ordered system. So what we see here is this, um, on the left you're seeing basically just the, the level of um, synchrony across, the average synchrony across all the brain regions. As we either turn up excitability going to the right, gain going up. And basically what you see is that th this white line shows where the system moves very quickly from being pretty much just sort of almost randomly behaving to being basically epileptic, like very highly correlated uh, fluctuations across all the regions. And it's that boundary right there where we think really interesting stuff is going on. So you see basically that as you approach the boundary, this is showing participation coefficient, right? Just below the boundary, participation coefficient's really low. Just above the boundary, it goes up much higher. And if we sort of align with that boundary and plot participation coefficient, this is what you see. So it jumps up pretty substantially right around that border. And that's the border at which people like Michael Breakspear, uh, Golo, and Kochi are arguing that uh, the brain actually operates. So this is just a first step towards, we think, trying to understand, you know, how is it that those, you know, sort of tweaks on really low-level neuronal features like neural gain could result in these very high level uh, you know, network sorts of features. There's a ton more to be done here. Um, and we're, we're continuing to collaborate with Michael Breakspear and, and his team on, on that. So I, let, me, let me stop and ask for questions first. Okay. So in the last little bit here, I want to talk about 
another way of thinking about these types of signals that, um, that really came, again, from Max Schein, kind of reading the literature really broadly, um, and being inspired, actually, by some work in C. elegans, right? This is this little worm with 302, 306 neurons, 300 and something neurons. Um, and there's some really cool work by Salcedo and colleagues that basically took these, took, did calcium recordings of all of the, you know, as many neurons as they could record, and then do a dimensionality reduction, just a principal analysis, to ask, you know, what does the low dimensional structure in the data tell you? And it turns out that you can pretty much predict the activity of the worm based on the first three principal components. Um, and this is basically showing like a phase plot of the brain state moving through time. Um, and so, so Mac was inspired by this to ask, what about the low dimensional dynamics of the human brain? So he took all of the, um, the data from the Human Connectome Project tasks and just put them all together for each subject. For each subject, you have them doing whatever the seven tasks concatenated, and then you just do PCA across those to try to get at, across all the tasks, what is the, you know, what's the common sort of neural uh, pattern that one sees over time? Um, and he did this first on 100 subjects and then replicated it on another 100. The nice thing about HCP is it's big, so you can do that. Um, so he focused on the first five principal components that explain a good bit of the variance. Obviously, there's more there because it's a really broad set of tasks. Um, but we're going to focus on the, the early components. So this is, if you just plot out you take those five principal components and plot out their activity over time with respect to the tasks, this is what you see, and we kind of put labels on them to describe how they behave. So the first one, the first principal component, basically is just whenever you're doing a task, it's on. So it's like the task positive component. Um, and then you get a couple that are more active for specific tasks, either for the social or language tasks or for the gambling and emotion tasks. And then you get a couple that show interesting changes over time. Right? One, the fourth principal component and it really is something that just kind of generally goes down across each block of trials regardless of the task. And the fifth one is really about kind of transitioning in and out of a task. So it's particularly active at the very beginning of tasks. Right. So this basically says that there's, a, there's sort of understandable, interesting low dimensional structure in the data. Now the question is what can we do with that? This is just kind of showing you what those, um, if we map each cortical surface voxel or this is Anglia and cerebellum um, mapped onto basically the weight of each of those um, principal components. You see that the, the principal components, this is showing a polar plot, by the way, um, for all of the different resting state networks. And you can see that they have um, sort of overlapping but distinct spatial uh, weights across uh, the, the five different components. So they're not, they're, they're clearly not completely distinct. Um, but they do have you know, differences in terms of like some being more heavily weighted on, say, the salience network or the ventral attention network. Um, one thing we could do then is ask, um, basically, how do they relate to, um, to different uh, cognitive engaged by these tests? So one, one way to do that is to just look at Neurosynth and ask, if you take the highest level so there's a set of topic models that have been done on the neuroscience data that give you kind of very high-level descriptors, incredibly high-level, right? Memory, language, cognitive, and motor. Those are the kind of the, the highest-level descriptors that one can get from neuroscience. And just ask how the two, just the first two principal components differ. And this is actually showing it for all five. Down at the bottom is showing it for the first two. How do they differ in terms of their engagement or in terms of their how the regions that they involve are related to different aspects of cognitive function. And basically what you see is, I mean, it's really clear for the, the first one, this is loading on the first principal component, that's the second one. And basically you see that, you know, language and motor stuff uh, loads highly on the second one, memory and cognitive loads low on the second one. For the first one, cognitive and motor loads high, memory and language loads low. So that you see that they have sort of distinct, have distinct uh, temporal time courses, they have distinct loadings on different aspects of cognitive function. Um, they also seem to have distinct relationships to kind of overall integration. So Mac took the tools that he had used in the neuron paper to understand temporal dynamics of connectivity and asked about participation coefficient. So it turns out that um, regions in, the, in the, that first principal component 
regions who, that are strongly associated with that first principle component also are most strongly um, kind of participatory in the sense that they correlate with lots of different uh, regions outside of their own modules, much, le much more than, than some of the other uh, principal components do. Um, finally, we wanted to, to kind of bring this back to understanding kind of what, you know, at the neurobiological level, what might be driving this. And one, one thing that we wanted to ask was, can we understand anything about the relative role of different neurotransmitter systems across these different principal components. And so we took advantage of the Allen Brain Institute Human Gene Expression Atlas. So basically what they did was they took six human brains, it's a limited data set because it's only six brains, but they basically did across a bunch of regions a uh, full transcriptomic analysis at each region to ask, you know, what are, what are expression patterns across the entire genome? We just focus on expression of a subset of uh, transcripts uh, that are related to neurotransmitters. Um, and so those are also mapped back in 3D space. Um, so is, we still don't have a good story about it, but I think it's, it's a, a pretty amazing finding. Um, so what I'm showing you here is um, the, the, the left-right axis is the first principal component, the up-down axis is the second principal component. Um, and this is showing basically what's the relationship between expression of each of a number of different neurotransmitter uh, genes and uh, loading of that region on those different principal components. So what, it, what this is showing first, so you, you may know that you know, most each, at least each of these neuromodulatory classes have neuromodulatory receptor groups has two different classes, right? They generally have one class that we think of as more of like a facilitatory pro-cognitive uh, version, like you know, D1 type receptors for dopamine and a class that shows more sort of inhibitory anti-cognitive types of effects like D2. Um, and um, the first thing that pops out here is that expression of, across all of these families of uh, genes, uh, all these families of neurotransmitters, expression of that, of the pro-cognitive version of that transmitter is positively correlated with uh, temporal uh, uh, actually, sorry, yes, with, uh, with PC1. Um, and, um, and so that's basically saying that, you know, it doesn't matter if it's dopamine or adrenaline or whatever. Um, basically, this, this first task positive component is associated with high loading on, with high expression of the kind of procognitive version of the gene and low expression of the anti-cognitive uh, version of the gene. Regions that are not in this, this that don't load highly on PC1 have higher expression of those anti ones. If we then look at the second principal component, you see you get sort of an orthogonal story where now it's sort of a difference between the different, the different uh, receptor types, right? So both for regions that load highly on that second principal component, dopamine genes are highly expressed across both types, right? So D1 and D2 like. Uh, noradrenaline, a little bit lower, but similar for both types, right? Uh, serotonin, lower. There's only there's only one of the, the um, cholinergic ones that we could look at, so we don't have a kind of a parallel one for that. But the idea is that these, you know, the, the differential regions have in terms of, you know, driving. Obviously, there's a ton more to be done here. Okay, so just to sum up, um, you know, it took me a long time to come around to thinking that resting fMRI was interesting. I'm, I'm now convinced. It's not obviously the be-all and end-all, and I think we still need task fMRI. Clearly, we're still using it quite a bit. Um, and I think that, you know, the way, to, the way that we think about it is, you know, you have this kind of functional backbone, and when you're just sitting doing nothing, you're going to kind of be within a relatively limited set of states that are kind of focused on that backbone. When you get driven by a task, it's going to sort of drive you out of that state. Um, and part of what's going to happen there is you're going to get um, and clearly more associated with, uh, it's strongly associated with more neuromodulatory systems, probably at least, but probably also as well, are playing a key role in that sort of network reconfiguration. And I think starting to have some ideas through a modulated relatively low dimensional dynamics across the brain. 
right, which is that um, there's 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 two groups of people out now who think about the brain in very different ways. One is the set of people who, who I, I would have, you know, to 15 years ago kind of aligned myself more with is people who think about, you know, parts of the brain as doing computations, right? So, like, I think that the hippocampus does a particular thing, which might be pattern separation or pattern completion. You know, another part of the brain does a particular computational operation. Um, so people from computational neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, often, or sorry, cognitive science often think about the brain that way. There's another set of people coming from network science and the, the field of sort of network neuroscience, right, who think about the brain in a very different way. They, they use analyses like I showed you today where you basically treat each of the parts of the brain as sort of interchangeable, right, and you compute things like what's the path length or what's the, you know, how connected is a region where it doesn't matter when we're computing these connectivity things, I'm not really caring about which particular things are connected to one another. I just want to know how connected is something outside of its module, right? Other than knowing what module it's in, I don't really care is it, you know, this particular one or that one, right? Um, and so the question, and, and that's exactly the way that people think about analyzing something like a airline, uh, you know, network. So the question is, you know, given that we know that different parts of the brain do different things, how can we integrate that way of thinking with thinking that comes from network neuroscience that lets us, you know, get a dynamics and kind of I see this as one of the biggest challenges is how do we take, for example, all the work that's being done in you know, uh, deep neural networks right now, which I think is starting to give us, at least for parts of the brain, a lot of insight into how those parts of the brain might do their thing, at least at a computational level. How do we integrate that with thinking about you know, how real brains actually do stuff? Because you know, I mean, one thing that's amazing, right, is that the human brain does its work on the amount of power that it takes, like 20 watts, right? The power that it takes to light a very dim light bulb. Um, whereas, you know, the, the, go look at how, you know, any of these deep learning systems work now. They're running on huge computers using uh, probably thousands of watts. Um, so I would think that one of the keys to understanding how brains actually do what they do in such a, an efficient way is, is based on dynamics. Um, and having a, a very efficient dynamical system. Um, and I think we, there's a ton more work to be done to understand that. So finally, I just want to thank, uh, particularly Max Schein is really the person who inspired a lot of the second half of the talk. Uh, Tim Lauman and C. Peterson were collaborators on the first half. Jeanette Mumford kind of really worked with me to, to, de to design the MyConnectome study and was deeply involved in that. And then the mo modeling work we did uh, with Michael Breakspear and his student, Matthew Auburn. Um, and thanks again for having me.